So this uh, started off with research at uh, Stanford, uh, but more recently we've been trying to build some of these ideas in a new project called Babylon Chain. So I'd love to hear some feedback from the crowd here. Uh, so anytime you want to inject a question, I think it's okay, right, uh, Kaspar? Question yeah. anytime is fine, right? Yeah, so this talk will not fill 45 minutes. So I'll give it plenty of time for talk. That's what the Barnet Bay tells me to do. Yes, okay. So, um, well, this is a Ethereum event. So Ethereum current focus is, of course, switch from Ethereum 1.0 to 2.0, so proof of work to proof of stake. So in addition to energy saving, of course, very important, there are two sort of uh, uh, benefits that one associate with this transition. One is it's faster, proof of stake is faster. And two, equally important, I think, is the fact that you have the ability to slash, to punish uh, attacker of your protocol. And this in proof of work is very limited capability. So these two are the um, perceived benefits of proof of stake. Now, I want to argue that it's actually not that simple. So life is a little bit more complicated than this. So this may be a summary of sort of the, uh, I, the, the main point of this talk, which is the following. So the, this axis is the latency, the latency of the system. And so proof of work confirmation is slow. It's of the order of minutes in Ethereum 1.0 and even up to hour or more than an hour in Bitcoin. So in general, proof of stake is slow. So proof of, sorry, proof of work, proof of work is slow. It's too early. It's too early in California, at least. <laughs> All right. Oh, a lot of people coming in. Good. All right, so proof of work is slow. Proof of stick is fast. Fast finality. A block shows up. A bunch of people vote. More than two-thirds vote. You get a confirmation. Bang, bang, bang. Of the order of seconds. Okay, so that's one definitely strong advantage of proof of stake. But it turns out that associated with this change to proof of stake, there are other operations that have to be, at least in the current system, very slow. Okay, so this includes two particular uh, type of event. One is withdrawal of stakes. How long can it, does it take? When people stick, how long does it take for people to keep the stake in the system until they withdraw? Very long in proof of stake system. Um, in, for example, Cosmos chains, this is 21 days. You can't hold the stake, you can't withdraw stake until 21 days. Ethereum 2.0, this time is not decided upon yet, as far as I understood, at least of, as of two days ago. Uh, but will be of the order of weeks, okay? Number two is a censorship recovery or censorship slashing, which is when you have transactions get censored, how can you slash people who are not voting properly? How can you recover from this situation? That also takes of the order of weeks, okay? And these two, since this is a, what's the name of this meeting? ETH. Ethconomics? Yes. It's hard, a little bit hard to pronounce. Ethconomics? So I thought this is like, okay, the, my, my connection to economics is that. This has implication to the running of proof of stake. Because if your deposit is held for a long time, then people can't take the money out. Then there are other mechanisms, like liquid staking, which tries to help people to be able to take the money out, more, more liquidity. So this has economic implication. If your censorship recovery is slow, then events like fraud proofs, you have to wait a long time for, in an optimistic roll up until you want to wait until the fraud proof shows up. So all this snow, slowness have economic implications on systems that are built on top of this proof of stake chain like Ethereum 2.0. So the main point of this talk is to say 
that well, actually there is a way to speed up this, these slow events. Okay? And what we want to make a statement is the following, is that, well, if you have a proof of stake system, like Ethereum 2.0, Without any external source of trust, okay, this is an impossibility theorem, which is that you really cannot provide slashability. It's impossible. So if you think about why these two events are so slow, it's really to use some kind of external trust to make the system slashable. So the speed of the latency, the speed of the chain, and the slashability interact in a complicated way, and the consequence is that you need external trust to make the system slashable, and as a consequence, the external, if the external trust used is social consensus, which is in the most of the current proof of stake system, then these two things are slow, okay? And the suggestion in this talk is that if you use other mechanism, the mechanism proposed here is Bitcoin timestamping. Then you can make these events much faster as in, a, in addition to providing the slashability to the protocol. So this is a, you can think of as an alternative to the slow social consensus process, okay? So that's the summary of this talk in one slide. So I'm going to, the rest of the talk, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail and to try to explain sort of how this, What's the limitation? Why do we need social consensus? And how Bitcoin timestamping can provide this benefit? And whether or not Bitcoin timestamping itself has any limitation? We'll explore that a little bit more today. Okay? All right, any question at this point? Cool. All right. Okay, so before I go to talk about the problem at hand, I need to review two concepts two concepts here, which is underlying the, uh, this notion of slashability and accountability. So what does accountability mean? This notion was introduced in the Casper paper um, quite a few years ago now. Basically, the accountable safety notion is the following fact, is that if there's a safety violation, okay, <laughs> then all clients, can provably identify at least F, F is typically one third, adversarial validators, which are protocol validator, okay? So that means what? That means you identify the ones that validators, and if you're not validator, you should not be identified. So that's what accountability means. Now, slashable safety is in some sense a stronger notion, and is not the same, is that now that you've identified them, well, you have to be able to punish them. And to punish them, you have to be, be able to punish them before they withdraw the stick. Okay? So that's what I meant by slashable safety. Which, you have to first hold, hold people accountable, but then you have to catch them before they leave the system. That's accountable safety. So this too is kind of a cornerstone ideas of this talk. Just want to make sure that we're on the same page. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with these notions already, but in a diverse audience, just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. So these two are cornerstone notion, which gives a notion of crypto economic security, okay? Which is sort of different from the standard notion of security in consensus protocols, which typically is making some trust assumption, assuming a certain fraction of users validators are honest. So this crypto economic security says that you don't really need to make any trust assumption. What you're guaranteeing is that if something bad goes wrong, then you can punish people, okay? So that directly connects the security system to economic consequences, all right? Okay, so to explain the difference between these two notions, okay? So let me talk about an attack and this attack is pretty well known in the proof of stake space. And uh, I'll call it exposed corruption attack. Okay, so this word exposed 
I learned from my friend Kaspar, uh, Latin word, which basically means after the event, after the event happens. So what event are we talking about here? All right, let's see what's happening here. So, all right, so stick is deposited at a certain time onto the chain, okay? The chain goes on. After a while, it is withdrawn, okay? Withdrawn. The stick is withdrawn. However, the keys associated with the stick still exist. The keys got bought by someone else, perhaps, or by the people who leave the system. They decide to use the same keys to build an alternate chain. So you have a canonical chain growing, and suddenly another chain shows up from the old coins. And this is exposed attack because this is after the event. What's the event? The event is the withdrawal of the stake. So after the withdrawal of the stake, an alternate chain got built. And now there is a safety violation. There's a safety violation because there's another chain. From the point of view of a client who's just joining the system now, the client who are already in the system saw this canonical chain, no problem. But for a new client joining the system, he cannot figure out which chain is which chain, which one is the canonical chain. So now there's a safety violation. There's a safety violation. Question, can we punish these people? And indeed, two thirds of the sticker has voted on two blocks of the same height here. So one third of them have double signed. One third of them has been identified. But it's too late because the stick has been withdrawn already on the canonical chain. And so no slashing has happened here. So this is an example of a system in which you have accountable safety, but not slashable safety. You have accountability, but you have no slashability. And from a Crypto economic point of view, it is slashability that is important. Accountability is only a means to an end. Okay, so this is an example of an attack which says that without any external mechanism here in this example, you cannot get slashable safety. So this is kind of the example which is rather generic and you can prove a theorem to make this more precise. And uh, Niels Brett loves this impossibility theorem. So, okay, so this is it. All right. Now, so to the new client, somehow it needs to be distinguished between old chain and new chain. So the typical way of resolving this problem, so there's a fundamental problem in proof of stake protocol. So the typical solution or the standard solution is through social consensus, Social consensus is something a little bit vague, what it really means. But roughly speaking, what it means is that external, an external, the external community sort of checkpoints the canonical chain once in a while to make sure that everyone sort of agrees on what is the canonical chain. And so that when you have a new chain showing up, an external client using this external trust can agree on what's the canonical chain. Okay, so this is social consensus. Uh, and two issues here. One is because it's social, it's outside the chain. It's typically a slow process. And so therefore, to take, it takes a long time for social consensus to be achieved. And so the withdrawal period, the withdrawal period has to be long enough so that it's longer or equal to the social consensus period, or Vitalik would call this weak subjectivity period. So in the Cosmos, for example, 21 days, Ethereum 2.0 of the order of a week, two weeks, and funds cannot be withdrawn during this period of time. So that locks the fund up. And that's the main, one of the main reasons why funds are, why, why stake has to be locked up. 
is to wait for the social consensus to occur before you let people go. That's number one. Number two, the one I would say not so satisfactory part of the solution is, is outside the blockchain. It's outside the blockchain. So that means that there is a part of the consensus going on that is not only the code. OK. All right. So now we have understood why we have such a slow withdrawal period due to social consensus. And now, the, if you think about it, what's going on here is that you basically have this notion of a new client joining, and they can't tell the system apart. But if you look at the situation for a, the online user, then it is clear that this chain is the canonical chain, because this is a chain that's been ongoing. And this is the new chain that shows up. New chain that shows up. And social consensus is really a way of sort of allowing the community to say, hey, this chain has been going on for a long time already. So basically, what social consensus is doing is some kind of time stamping. So the idea here is to automate this time stamping using some error of time, some error of time. And a good error of time that we know of is Bitcoin. Okay? And in fact, in Nakamoto's paper, in this abstract, he mentioned that he wants to solve the double spam problem using a timestamp server. So he's thinking of Bitcoin as a consensus protocol, obviously. But more fundamentally, it's a timestamping server which timestamp events. In the case of Bitcoin, the events are the transactions, the Bitcoin transactions. But now we can think of this as a timestamping server in the abstract. And now you can use this timestamping server in a different way than just timestamping Bitcoin transactions. So here, we can use it to timestamp the events that happens on the proof of stake chain. OK. All right, so let's see how it works, how timestamping can prevent the ex post attack. I really like this ex post attack. So I'm going to keep on talking about it until I get familiar with this concept. I really didn't know before I met Casper. All right. OK. All right, so Bitcoin has a parameter called K. I don't know why it's called K, but K deep confirmation. OK. So in this example, K equals 3. Typically, people would use something like k equals 6. k equals 6 is too long. New Strike got lazy in doing the animation, so we just have k equals 3 here. OK. <laughs> All right. So that means what? That means whenever a block is 3 deep in the chain, then it's regardless confirmed. OK? And this k is, of course, a parameter that you can vary. It doesn't have to be 6. It doesn't have to be 3. It can be anything. But there's a parameter here, k. Okay? And so now what we do is that as we grow the proof of stick chain, every now and then, we will send the POS block header, we'll send the POS block header, all right, to Bitcoin as a transaction into the Bitcoin network. Bitcoin miners will include it, include it into a Bitcoin block with a block header, okay? And then, the chain, both the proof of stake chain and the proof of work chain, the Bitcoin chain grows. And then when the timestamp, the block header is three deep, k equals three in this example, then I consider this POS block as checkpointed. checkpointed. Timestamp, that means, hey, this block has occurred at a particular time and is confirmed in Bitcoin, so I know that it will remain in the Bitcoin chain forever, confirmed. And this thing goes on, and now suppose there's a withdrawal request. Withdrawal request, OK? Withdrawal request. Not a withdrawal, but a request. And this can be timestamped on Bitcoin as well. So in this example here, it's timestamped on Bitcoin. Again, you wait. Now, now the question is, when can I withdraw the funds? Well, the claim here is that as long as the checkpoint, the timestamp, is three block deep, confirming Bitcoin. Then I will allow 
the funds will be withdrawn. Okay. A lot of funds will be withdrawn. Now, why does this prevent the exposed attack that we discussed earlier? So now let's imagine the exposed attack uh, happening. Well, in the exposed attack, the new chain is built after the withdrawal event. Exposed, after. Okay? Because it's after, whatever timestamp it can get will be a later timestamp, a later timestamp on Bitcoin. So therefore, by looking at, as a client to Bitcoin, by looking at the POS client, they can look at Bitcoin and say, hey, this timestamp associated with this other chain is a newer timestamp. So newer timestamp here. So this one has the earlier timestamp, and I should regard the one with the earlier timestamp as the canonical chain. Okay, so in this way, the ex post attack is thwarted. Okay, it's thwarted. And here, the withdrawal delay of this protocol, okay, is basically the k in this example, k equals three. So you have to wait for three blocks deep. So in general, the withdrawal delay is the time to wait until the block is confirmed in Bitcoin. So now we're getting latency, withdrawal delay, at Bitcoin latency, basically. Okay. Now, this idea was proposed in a similar version in a paper a few months ago. Okay. This is a, basically you can think of this as a way of keeping track of the validator set as it changes. In that paper, they analyzed this one particular attack. But from a security point of view, we discussed a lot two days ago, is that we have to worry about not only one attack, but whether or not this kind of scheme can protect against all kinds of attacks, all kinds of attacks. Now, it turns out, though, that there's another attack that can provide some problem to this protocol, so that we need to add something to this. OK. All right, so here we have the same situation. But now, this attack is an ex ante attack. OK, Kaspar, what does ex ante means? Ex ante means before the event. <laughs> OK, before the event. OK. Now, what is the event again? The event is the withdrawal event, OK? So this one, the attacker is more, e even more evil, is planning ahead of time of this attack. So how does it plan ahead of time? Because now it knows that there's a time stamping server, so the post attack doesn't work. So it has to plan something more clever. And so here's what's happening here in this attack. OK, so the POS chain grows. The time, the P uh, Bitcoin chain also grows. And now there's a block header that shows up, POS block header that shows up on the Bitcoin chain. But actually, there's no data available. There's no data available to it. OK? According to the earlier protocol, you just goes on and continue time stamping. OK? And then the POS block header with the canonical chain with the withdrawal request is three block deep. And so the funds are withdrawn. OK, the funds are withdrawn. All right. But now the attacker shows the chain. And in fact, this chain was actually built ex ante. OK? So in this attack, the chain was built ex ante. The proof of stake block header was posted on the chain to timestamp it in advance. Timestamp in advance. And so, if the client believes, if the uh, online client is following the canonical chain, the new client actually now believes that the attacker chain is actually the canonical chain. So now that is a safety attack. Again, you can't punish. You can pu it's a cannibal, but you can't slash them. Okay. So this shows that the protocol 
just a naive protocol of time stamping alone is not enough to protect against all such attacks, okay? All such non slashable attacks. Yeah. The data available means that you have a block header up there, right? This chain was, this lower chain was built in private. So in other words, the proof of stake validators cannot see the block, okay? Cannot see the block associated with that block header. That's what it means. Thank you. All right. So there's a natural way, I mean, the way I pose it, there's a natural way of solving this problem, this attack. Is that whenever you see such a block header, okay, on a chain, and you can't find the data, the proof of stake value data, then you should not further confirm your ledger. You should stop and say, hey, there's, something, there's some issue here. And store the system until you see the block, or well, if you don't see the block for a long time, then you have to do something to the system. That will prevent the safety problem, okay? Now, and so here, it is important that the block header contains all the signatures of the validators, okay? The oh, that's what I oh sorry, I cannot see it. I cannot see no, it's okay. So you only you should shout. Only block headers that are signed by a supermajority are, are allowed to be checkpointed on the Bitcoin chain. Is that the idea? Yeah, that's right. So that's what I was going about to say now, yeah, right no, now. I, that's right. <laughs> yes. So it is important to have the block header with all the signatures there. Yeah. Not just a hash. Okay. Not just a hash of the block. Because then, to you will not break for anything other than this very bad event, which is now a super majority of the validator is creating this attack. Okay? All right. Okay. Now, so with this addition to the BMS protocol, we can prove a theorem which says that if we assume that Bitcoin is secure, then a proof of stake protocol together with Bitcoin timestamping and this emergency breaking will provide slashable safety. That means all attacks, there's no non slashable attack anymore. So I showed two examples, but a theorem can be proved that any attack can be thwarted. So now you have full slashable safety, full slashable safety with the benefit that withdrawal delay is reduced to Bitcoin confirmation latency. Okay. All right, so we have achieved one of the two items here, okay? So now we hopefully explain clearly, I explain clearly that with Bitcoin timestamping and some addition feature that I discussed, you can shift the withdrawal latency from weeks to Bitcoin latency. So now the second item I want to discuss is censorship recovery. So it turns out you can use Bitcoin timestamping also to speed up the censorship recovery. So if you think about it, withdrawal period, and what we discussed earlier, is about slashable safety. Censorship recovery is about slashable lifeness. So now we want to say, OK, if one third of the validator decides to censor a transaction, OK, how can we slash those guys? And how can we recover from the bad situation? That's censorship recovery. So this is about liveness. So I've shifted. So when you design a system, you want to worry about both about safety and about liveness. So Bitcoin timestamping can give me full slashable safety. Now let's see how we can improve on the liveness guarantee. OK? All right. So actually, this is a, I believe this is an idea of Vitalik. Uh, in Ethereum 2.0, it's called inactivity leak. So this is the, um, I think, the current way of doing censorship recovery on Ethereum 2.0. Uh, inactivity leak. So how does that work? So let's quickly review that. Okay. So um, I have a block proposed, but there's a transaction there that wants to, that 
people want to censor. So this transaction is, this block is not being confirmed. What the inactivity leak is saying, hey, that's because not, some people are not voting. If they're not voting, there's inactivity, then I'll leak the stick slowly, leak the stick slowly, so that these attackers, the adversary, has lower and lower stick until honest becomes super majority again, super majority again. And then the block gets confirmed and the chain continues to grow. Okay? So this is the inactivity leak procedure. All right? Now, in so this is a slashing mechanism as well as a recovery mechanism. Now, in accountable safety, in accountable safety, you catch you catch people who double sign. Okay? So you never catch people who are honest, because honest people never double sign. So honest people are never caught by mistake in accountable safety. However, in, in, in this inactivity leak, actually you can catch honest people. How? So, so here's the attack, inactivity leak attack. Now in this inactivity leak attack, the attacker Okay, builds another chain, and in this chain, the attacker is the only one who is building this chain. The honest guy did not see this chain, so they cannot participate. So they're not participating. So in this chain, the attacker is creating an alternate history, an alternate story. Is that hey, those honest guys are actually bad. They are not participating, so I'm going to slash them until they get slashed. The honest guy got slashed. And so now there are two alternate versions of history. One, the correct history. One, the attacker history. And again, for a newly joining client, of course, for an existing client, no problem. But for a newly joining client, then there has to be a way of distinguishing between these two versions of history. If you can't distinguish them, then the honest guy can be slashed. So, Slashing liveness is a much more tricky concept than slashing safety. Okay? And this inactivity leak uh, has a risk of slashing honest people. Okay. So again, one can prove a theorem which says that not only inactivity leak doesn't really work by itself, is that if you don't have an external source of trust, then accountable liveness, that is, you punish only the bad people, never punish the wrong people. It's impossible. You can't do it without external trust. And so you can, again, use social consensus to try to recover from this bad situation. And again, social consensus basically allows you to sort of checkpoint that, hey, you know, the chain that has been around for a long time is actually the, the, honest, the correct chain. And so it breaks this symmetry, this indistinguishable symmetry, OK? But again, social consensus is very slow. So therefore, the inactivity leak has to be very, very slow as well, so that you don't have people leak very fast and then get out, OK? So this is, again, very slow. And so again, you can use Bitcoin to timestamp and figure out which one is the is the canonical chain. And now the question is, how much of recovery can we do? How strong can we recover the situation? Now, we had this mo notion of emergency breaking to give us the safety, to give us the notion of safety. But it has an implication on liveness. Okay, and what's the implication? is that we know that if there's an unavailable checkpoint Bitcoin, then liveness stalls. OK, so when can this happen? When can liveness stall? Well, it can happen if there's an unavailable checkpoint. Unavailable checkpoint means what? That means 2 thirds supermajority validators have put a timestamp, but the block is not available. So these are attackers. These are attackers. So that means that if there is more than 2 thirds adversary, then we cannot really guarantee liveness. So we prove a positive result, though, is that as long as 
okay? You have proof of stake as at least, if the, if the stake is at least minority owners, minority owners. So this is a relatively weak assumption. You only require one third owners. Then the emergency breaking doesn't happen. And we can prove that you can always use Bitcoin to do fast recovery, to do fast recovery. Fast means, whenever I say fast here, I mean fast compared to social consensus. And fast here means Bitcoin latency. OK? So that allows us to shift censorship re recovery to Bitcoin confirmation time, time scale. OK? So from weeks to minutes slash hour. OK? All right. Now, if you look at this theorem, for a purist, perhaps, it is still not a fully crypto economic security. Because I'm still making a trust assumption on the proof of stake chain. Okay? Now, the trust assumption is quite weak now because I only require one third minority owners, not majority, not, not two third majority. Typically, you make two third majority assumption. Here, I'm reducing it to only one third minority. And together with Bitcoin, I can, get, I can guarantee liveness. But is so the, what, but one question is, well, can you remove even this assumption? OK? Can you remove this assumption? And the theorem we prove is that, no, you cannot remove this assumption. Without any more assumption, OK, then you can't guarantee, say, liveness at all, in all cases, or slashable liveness in all cases. OK? What we discovered is that uh, if you, on the other hand, add one more service, which is a data availability service, which is you timestamp, and you have an external trusted data availability service, then you can prove a theorem which says that you can actually get fast recovery without making any more trust assumption on the proof of stake chain. Okay? So in some sense, the one third minority assumption, one third minority assumption is kind of like saying that you are as you're making your you you under this assumption then the data availability service is provided by the chain itself by chain itself let's say ethereum 2.0 is providing data availability itself for another chain which is not as big as ethereum 2.0 which you do not want to make this assumption even then perhaps you can use an external data availability service which is trustworthy then you have full crypto economic security of your system OK? Great. Yes? I, I just wanted to ask you about um, relying on Bitcoin. All of these theorems are like, if Bitcoin is secure, why can we assume that Bitcoin is secure without relying on social consensus? Because it does rely on social consensus as well, right? If there's a real of longer than six blocks, then this whole system is broken. So Bitcoin has no explicit social consensus method procedure, though, right? Ethereum 2.0 is going to have an explicit. It uh, hasn't been implemented yet, but. Uh, but but it, what, what, what do you do if there's a Bitcoin real? Then your, your whole system is broken, right? And you've allowed everyone to withdraw. Yeah, yeah. So that's. Uh, yo, OK. So, good. So, OK. So what happens if Bitcoin is broken? Wow, this is a, this is a bad design here. We, we know it's broken, though, right? Like, we know that the NSA could hoard mining equipment, and they could do a six block reorg really easily. They could do a, a thousands of blocks reorg if they wanted to, right? And in that case, Bitcoin social consensus would come in and say, no, this is not the real Bitcoin chain. The real Bitcoin chain is the one that we built without the NSA. And there would be still weak subjectivity in Bitcoin. Yeah, so if, if the POS chain is not broken, and Bitcoin is broken, this protocol has the advantage that Bitcoin will, the breaking of Bitcoin will not affect this protocol. Sure. So, you so if both are broken, so they break, then it's really the broken. Then if both are broken, then it's really, then, yeah, then, <laughs> then that's it. <laughs> and then that's it. But if you, if you don't tie your proof of stake chain to Bitcoin, and you keep the social consensus at weight, then you're still just relying on the same social yes. consensus, and you don't have this extra attack vector of yes. some so, other chain. So, so, 
Okay, so it turns out that what happens is that when Bitcoin is broken, okay, yeah. when Bitcoin is broken, then you have no more uh, time step. You have no more time step. So you can still have a social consensus. So you can stop people from withdrawing at that point, and you can still fall back to your long withdrawal. Well, why, why don't you have time stamps? Like if the NSA are putting uh, proof of stake time stamps in their blocks, then... It's data unavailable. It's data unavailable. So you stop at that time. But it's, they can reveal the chain, right? They can do an ex ante, OK? No, no, no. You, so that's why there's a stalling mechanism in the proof of stake. But you've got the you've got the canonical chain still, right? On and the proof of stake. Timestamp on the original Bitcoin chain, and then you bring it up to a different Bitcoin chain that has completely different timestamps that are supermajority size, and they're completely available as soon as they're revealed, right? So the but the so you have now a safety attack on Bitcoin. Yeah. But you have no safety problem in proof of stake, or you have safety. No, they attack both at the same time. You attack both at the same time. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, right? If you attack both at the same time, then it's like. But my yeah. point is, if there's not a second one to attack, and you have the long social consensus, then there's not. You know, then they can't attack you by a Bitcoin. They 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 just have to attack the social consensus, and they can't attack the social. consensus. Because we, we, we go, no, that's the NSA, that, that chain's down and black person, right? Yeah, so let's think about, yeah, okay, good, good question. Let's think about how to protect that really catastrophic case. Thank you. It is okay. catastrophic. Oh, okay. So, but social the social companies can always kick in. Right? Like, there is no, even if you have this system, you could always say, yeah, they attacked <laughs> both, now we just follow this chain. So, that's always a permanent yeah. backstop. Well, so, there is no, so only if the both get But that's my point. It doesn't win us anything over social consensus. So we, we may as well not tie Ethereum security to Bitcoin's environmentally destructive proof of work. Well, and it also means that not only would you have to run a consensus client and an execution client, but you have to run a Bitcoin pull node to stay. Yeah. And that's I'm thinking about this very practically, like as an Ethereum proof of stake developer. Like, I wouldn't want to do this. <coughs> I wouldn't really. We could we could put uh, proof of like proof of stake checkpoints on the Bitcoin chain, and people could optionally use that to do weak subjectivity thing. That would be cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But shortening the withdrawal period, I think, is very risky. Excellent. Weird. This thing is not working. Um, anyways, thank you, David. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you.